Carter Minor was raised on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi during a transformative time in American history. Often victimized by Jim Crow laws and racism, Joy navigated systemic marginalization to become a black woman engineer and oceanographer. She was the first U.S. citizen qualified by the International Hydrographic Organization to certify nautical charts for the U.S. Navy. She has supported the Chief of Naval Operations in the Pentagon on the air-sea battle concept and transition technologies to the warfighter in response to urgent needs in maritime and regular warfare. She has provided systems engineering support to the United States Navy, Coast Guard, Missile Defense Agency, the Non-Lethal Weapons Program, and the Department of Homeland Security. Joy received the Armed Forces Civilian Service Medal for her contributions surveying the Albanian Sea following the Bosnian War. She was the Naval Oceanographic Office Federal Women's Program Mentor of the Year, was competitively selected to attend the Royal Navy Hydrographic Long Course at HMS Drake in Plymouth, UK, and is certified by the International Hydrographic Organization as a Class A Hydrographer. Joy has a BS in chemistry from Mississippi University for Women, a Master's of Science degree in Systems Engineering from John Hopkins University, and a Master of Divinity from the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. She is currently a doctoral student in international development at the University of Southern Mississippi, majoring in security and social cultural studies. Well, today on Becoming Discipline, we interview Joy Carter Minor. So, Joy, welcome to Becoming Discipline. Thank you, Tony. I'm glad to be here. Excited to have this conversation. Well, for our listeners, I don't invite anyone on this show who is not disciplined in at least one of the following areas. Spirituality, mental, physical, emotional, slash relationships, finance, calendar, time, home organization, or data organization. And I want my audience to know that I have personally seen Joy express extreme discipline in several of these areas. Now, she probably doesn't even think of herself as disciplined in these areas, but I've seen it. I've seen it in her. So uh, I would not bring her uh, to our audience if I had not seen this myself. Uh, before we talk about the issue of discipline, though, let's try to understand your context. As both of us, as, as lovers of the Bible, we know that context is everything. Absolutely. Uh, so, so Miss Joy, can you tell us about Moss Point, Mississippi? You know, Moss Point sits between New Orleans, Louisiana and Pensacola, Florida. Um, I grew up in a um, dynamic time in the South. Um, uh, we were integrating schools in Mississippi when I was born. And I had, I don't even know if it's a privilege or a curse, being between generations that were learning to live together and uh, bridging the gap for those uh, generations. And I didn't realize it then until I looked back over my life that I've played that role throughout my entire life, whether it was um, generations or genders or races. I've seemed to always been in the middle, bridging the gaps between people who had differences. Oh, wow. So wow. Moss Point is a sleepy town on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. We're surrounded by rivers, Escataba River, Pascagoula River. Um, we're, we love the water. I grew up on the water. Everywhere you look, there's water. So, you know, and, and, and I use that uh, uh, analogy a lot because, you know, there's places where two rivers meet mm. and they have to learn and negotiate their boundaries. You'll find that in scripture as well. And so I just find that symbolic of my life, always being between two rivers and having to negotiate those boundaries. Powerful, powerful. Now, what kind of family did you grow up in? Did you grow up in a traditional or unconventional family? Um, one would call it traditional. I grew up with both my parents. But what made it interesting was that um, my parents were both educated. And that was, and they were teachers for a while, even though my father moved on to human resources. That would seem normal today. But growing up in Mississippi and considering that my parents were born in, born in the 30s, that was not traditional. So it would seem very traditional today, 
but it was not traditional for them having to raise us in an environment. And, you know, we, we lived in a very loving town, um, but I felt like there was a lot of respect for us because we had both of our parents and they were both educated and they didn't just push us. They pushed everybody in the community. Now, growing up, did you go into school? Did you ever face any jealousy because of that? Um, you know, I think just by human nature, when people meet you, there's this immediate level of jealousy. But once they got to know me and my family, that went away. I think it was a lot of respect after that. But first impressions is, ah, they think, I've, I've been told that. You think you're better than everybody else. But then, no, she's really a good person. <laughs> Amen. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. So who was the most disciplined person in your early childhood development? So discipline was a blessing and a curse for me because um, growing up, I thought my father was too strict. He was very disciplined. He is today. He's with me now. He's visiting me for a couple of weeks. He'll be going back to Mississippi a couple of months, actually. But my father was and still is very, very disciplined. Um, and I, I'll use the analogy, some, some of the greatest people like Michael Jackson, they like to talk about the discipline that they grew up, grew up with as, it, as if it were a negative, but they would not have been the people that they are had they not had that level of discipline. My father did not accept a 95 as a good grade. Mm. His response would be, where's the other five points? Mm. You know, and as a child, it's like, huh, I can't do enough. But it it caused me to always try to do better. Wow. You know, he was a strict disciplinarian. Wow, 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 wow. Well, that's a that's a golden nugget for all of the parents listening today. <laughs> Amen. That's a golden nugget for all of the parents listening today. Now, um, one of the reasons I invited you on the show is, believe it or not, it's not all of your accolades and all of your education. I invited you on because... Um, during a very tense time that you and I went through the went through together, you have a Zen like calm, even during stressful situations. And uh, I wanted you to let uh, our audience know, where did you get that from? So going back to my parents, my father was the type who would react. My mother was the type who would not. And I observed them and I remember making a conscious decision to try to be somewhere in the middle. I didn't be, I didn't want to be the one that would react and be angry and hot headed all the time, but I didn't want to be as passive as my mother. There were times when she should have reacted and she didn't. Sure. And so it was, it was something I had to learn to do because by nature I'm emotional. I want to react. I want to say, I want to do, I want to make things happen. But I watched how my mother worked. Mm. I also watched how she would tell him, you're too, you're, you're going too fast. You're too hot headed. She would calm him down and I wanted to be somewhere in the middle. You know, if somebody said something to me that upset me, um, my initial reaction was to feel sad and angry and I want to say something back. But I remembered how my mother reacted and mm. I wanted to don't react. And now I give myself always at least 24 hours. I don't care how angry I am. I am not going to respond until I've slept on it. OK, that's powerful. That's powerful. Now, I know they pushed you academically, but did they push you in sports? I played basketball. <laughs> I love basketball. I played from middle school to high school. And that is another example of how I was always bridging the gap because um, my parents did not grow up with much. They had to earn everything that they got. I mean, that's an entirely different story. But we lived on one side of town. And then um, because we lived in, on the water, it was always flooding. My father decided the house had been flooded one time too many. And we were going to move on the other side of town. So after, you know, we had a lot of racial tension moving on the other side of town. So I went from playing basketball one side of town and being really good and having a, a you know, good team moving on the competitive side of town <laughs> where our rival was and playing on that team. But I ended up bridging the gap between the two schools. Oh, you wow. know, I knew people in on both sides of the neighborhood. It's like, hey, they're good people. We're just this is just game. It's just a game, right? Right. Um, right. And so I always played that middle of the road, bridge the gap role in life. That's powerful. 
That's powerful. I love basketball. I still do now. If I were not so old, I would play now. <laughs> <laughs> You're not old at all. You're not old at all. Age is not a number. Age is not a number. So um, now I know your dad had high standards, but who helped you with the, and, and I didn't learn this until much later in life, um, who, who helped you with the structure of good study habits? Who was that person? That was trial and error. Um, I never studied much in high school. And what I probably didn't tell you was I was probably not structured because I decided one day that I was never going back to school because I didn't want any more discipline. Mm. I did not graduate from high school. Oh, wow. wow. I left, but I, did, I left with a plan. Um, I, there was a school, the college that my parents had gone to had a summer program. Mm. And I knew that there had been a few people who had gone to that summer program and skipped their senior year of high school, not many. So I had a plan. I was gonna to apply to the summer program. It was called a health sciences summer program. I knew I wanted to be in the sciences. I applied to the program, I got in. And during the course of the summer program, I scored really high marks. So I went in to registrar's office one day. I was like, I don't wanna go back home. Oh, wow. Can I stay? Wow. And I stayed. Wow. So I got my high school diploma about two years ago. The school oh, wow. decided to send it to me after all of these years. But wow, um, what an amazing story. The summer program um, was my introduction to discipline and study because I found out that, you know, you may be smart, but if you're not disciplined, you're not going to do anything. And I met other people who had discipline, may not have been as smart as me, but they had more discipline than I had. And I latched on to those people. So that was my introduction. And then after that, I was really motivated by watching other people and what made them successful. How were they good? And I wanted to be like them. If it meant I had to go buy another book or just carry books around with me all the time, I just stopped carrying a backpack with me everywhere I went. I had a car full of books. I had a backpack full of books. Right. But and I learned that from other people. If you don't know how to do it, look. <laughs> you know? Wow, wow, wow. wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's profound. Now, I, I ask this of all of our guests, and this is a little off topic, but the reason why I ask this, the context is uh, the studies show that one of the cornerstones of discipline is uh, are you a good sleeper or how well you sleep? And I, that's what I wanted to ask you as an academic how good it, are you a good sleeper or, 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 oh, you're already saying no. Okay. <laughs> you struggle with that area. I don't sleep well because I can't shut my brain off. Mm. If I get three hours of sleep, it's a good night for me. If I get more than that, I have to force myself to sleep. Mm. I wish I could sleep better. I got my Fitbit. I'm, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, but I cannot shut my brain off. Okay. And so I I, if I'm three or four hours, it's a good night for me. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, there are that that is an anomaly. You are pushing through. You are definitely pushing through. Now you shared about your college college experience. What I would like to know is how you're also a person of great faith. How has your knowledge of science impacted your faith? Hmm. Believe it or not, science has never had any impact on my faith. Believe it or not, theology has challenged my faith more than science has. I'm able mm. to separate the two. I'm able to separate, you know, the physical from the metaphysical. I can separate the two. But when I started studying studying theology, that's when I start questioning everything that I believed. And even now when I'm preparing sermons, I have to physically tell myself to take the natural out of it and think of it in spiritual terms. I'm more challenged by theology than science. I'm easily separate the two. Um, God speaks to me through nature. So mm -hmm. I can take anything physical and see God in it. Sure. You know, whatever it is, even if it's something that's being man-made, handmade by man, I can still see God in it. Sure. But when I'm studying theology, I am challenged. You know, I believe I have faith, but I have to. And so that, that's why I study a lot. So then I'm going, I'm looking at the prophecies. I'm looking at, you know, the, I'm, I'm trying to put it all together. And then sure. some things I just have to believe that it is God. Amen. 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 Understandable. Understandable. I've gone through those, uh, <laughs> through, through those challenges, uh, especially. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just share my side of that just to have some uh, back and forth. With, back and forth is that I, uh, I used to be a spoken word artist. And, you know, when you're a spoken word artist, you do poetry at the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually some 
philosophy students, you know, kind of came up to me and at the end of a poem mm -hmm. that was about God, because I was doing poetry about God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they started hitting me with questions that were a little uh, tougher than the questions I would receive at my local church or right, tougher right. than even questions I received in the prison ministry. I had done prison mm -hmm. ministry as well. And these questions were a little tougher and it kind of made me go through what I call my apologetic season. Where yep, I went through absolutely. Apologetics. And uh, and in the end, I came out with a stronger faith. But when you learn how the sausage is made, I guess you could say it, yep, it can absolutely. be it can be challenging. It can. Yeah. Uh, well, even it can. when I was called to preach, when I felt the call on my life to minister and, and it, I w it came from nowhere. It's like, where is this coming from? And I and I, you know, I won't say I ran from it. I wanted to understand it. Sure. And in my conversations with God, um, some of the things that I share with God, and this is in our conversation, is that I don't know what I believe. I don't know. You know, I don't I don't how much of this. The Bible doesn't make sense to me in a lot of areas. And because I have an analytical mind, I want this one, two, three. This is how it is. This is how it's going. I want it to make sense to me. And I really struggle with that. But day one in seminary just answered all of my questions about why I had so many questions. And then I could rest and trust the process that I could learn theology and still have my faith intact when it was all over. Mm. Mm. Well, I have an off script question for you. Uh, I have uh, this one, mm -hmm. this one, as you were talking to kind of, I heard and, and something that I, that has kind of resonated with people in my church is that your relationship with your father, your physical father can impact your theological views. Time for Tony's Golden Nugget. Every aspect of my life, I had, I learned that in seminary, we had formation Every aspect of my life, I found my relationship with my father in it. Mm -hmm. Every aspect. In fact, you know, we had to write in our formation class, like relationship with different members of our family from birth to six, from six to 12. And everywhere the theme of my relationship with my father was there without exception. Wow, wow, wow. And I share that golden nugget for our listeners <laughs> that uh, if you want to understand how you think and understand sometimes even... Uh, the times that you struggle with your faith or yep. the times that you're strong with your faith. Yep. A lot of that goes back to your early childhood Absolutely. formation. Absolutely. Amen. Now, how has your faith impacted your level of discipline? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, because I would consider I had a somewhat challenging childhood in the house and outside of the house. I remember um, my faith being integral to me, even I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about a personal relationship with God. I can remember from as young as at least nine that I had a really personal relationship with God. So much so that when the Gideons gave us these little red Bibles, mm -hmm. that was my diary. And I wrote in it every day uh -huh. in the margins. It was all written up. And no matter what I wanted, the only thing I could remember was Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer. And I think I could remember something in Luke about the birth of Jesus. But I used that Bible every day, no matter what I was going through. And it also helped me calm down, you know, because I would get very tense and stressed out about things. But um, I used that Bible. So I've had that relationship all along. And I would always go back to that. Um, not knowing what God was doing in my life. I'm preaching in a couple of weeks and the sermon title is going to be God knows what he's doing. Because when you pull the thread and you look back over your life, you realize that he was always there. You know, mm. that's why this happened. That's why this happened. But I've always used the word, not when I, even when I didn't understand the relationship, I've always used the word to give me balance. Always. Wow. Always. That's great. That is great. That is great. Now, uh, the next question is about emotional discipline and something that I consider you uh, just someone that is extremely emotionally disciplined. You're a very successful person. And my question is, how do you establish healthy boundaries with family and friends who may be at a different place within their journey? You know, that's a that's a process. You know, you don't <laughs> learn right away. That's a process. And I evolved and. So the foundational to that evolution is me understanding me. Um, I grew up in a family. My father's very talkative, very sociable. 
Um, it was very normal for people to come in and out of our houses, entertainment. But I was an introvert and I didn't know that. And once I got older and I realized that I'm an introvert, but I, I can communicate with people. I have extrovert skills. Once I learned what my space was, what made me happy, I don't allow people to violate that space. Sure. Um, I have to find healthy boundaries. I learned a lot about myself in seminary that I can be so introverted that I'm closing people off. Mm -hmm. But it's what keeps me focused. Sure. And so I met people who um, helped me with that. I call them my accountability partners. Awesome. They'll say, you can't do that, <laughs> you know, <Absolutely>. especially <laughs> in ministry. And sure. so I trust them enough to let me put me in check when I've been closed off too long. Mm. Um, because I can sit in a room with a computer or a book, never come out. Mm. No, I, my thing is, I don't like the phone. I don't want to hit a phone ring. I don't want to get a text. I don't want to do anything. I just want to stay focused. But I'll have accountability partners sure. that I trust who will say, you need to do something. <laughs> you know? Amen. Be disciplined. Subscribe now. <laughs> Amen. Well, we all need those people to kind of pull us out of the dungeon sometimes. And, yeah. uh, and that's the good. That's also a good thing about weekly fellowship. You know that yep, at, the, at least uh, well, when we were able to have we keep weekly mm -hmm. fellowship on a regular. But you know, it's interesting that in a church environment, and you know, and I consider that a family environment. I don't feel that need to be closed off. Mm. But when I'm idle chatter, <laughs> and if I have to hear the same thing over and over and over, my insides are turned like I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. Right. So I have to train myself. To be more attentive, mm. even if it's not interesting to me, you know, right, just right, be more right. attentive. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I truly struggle with that as well. Because <laughs> when the conversation is going on to just foolish things, then yeah. I it's just if I, you know, it it, it can be very challenging for me. I, I have, have a, I have a saying that I use sometimes, and I I use it sparingly. Uh -huh. But if someone comes to me year after year after year. And it's the same issue. I don't mind a new issue. I start telling them I'm not Jesus. Amen. You know, you can take anything you want to take to Jesus as often as you want. Amen. But I'm not Jesus. Amen. So I'm getting off this train. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, you also did something very disciplined. You wrote a book. And, mm -hmm. and can you share with our listeners your process for writing a book? And, and the reason why I'm asking that is you were already, I'm assuming, you know, you already work in a job and you had other responsibilities. So how in did you school. Call, Yeah, in <laughs> school. So how did you carve out that time to, to write a book? Um, first, I was really driven. Um, my mom passed in December of 17. So like anybody else, books always in the back of your head. I want to write a book. I want to write a book. I want to write a book. And I had actually had a fairly lengthy manuscript. And a lot of the manuscript had to do with my relationship with my father. And it wasn't intended to. Sure. It wasn't intended to. But at the end of it, I realized that it was more therapeutic for me, that first manuscript. And it was not for public consumption. That was for me to clean up my Time for Tony's Golden Nugget. And so when I finally decided to be focused, I took sticky pads. And I had them all over the wall on themes that I wanted to cover, things that had happened that I wanted to write about. And then as each theme showed up in the book, the sticky note came down. Mm. And then sometimes sticky notes went up. I had to find a place to put it. In fact, after putting, I call it my data dump, after putting all the sticky notes on the, on the wall, then I started organizing them. This goes here and this goes here and this goes here. And then well, I want to move this over here. But the book was pretty much organized by sticky notes. Okay. You know, that so that all the themes were in there. And then as I got each theme in the book, the sticky notes came down and it helped me track my progress on how I was doing with the with writing the book. Okay. All right. Well, that's another golden nugget there. We're <laughs> gonna keep we're gonna keep that. I like that. That's truly you must be a visual learner. Is that I am a visual learner? Okay. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely. Right. That's right. That I think you're gonna you just helped me there a great deal. <laughs> um you know, uh, you've helped me. I think you helped me more than you know. Um, I, I've learned as an adult that I do have some um, level of attention deficit. Sure. And so now, and, and my daughter was definitely ADD. I don't do anything without notes and lists and checkoffs. You know, I learned with my daughter, if I say, go clean up your room, nothing happens. Mm. But if I say, go get the shoes, check it off. Go get the clothes off the floor, check it off. 
time. And so I structure my life the exact same way. Don't try to eat the elephant all at once. Just right. pick one thing, get that done. Pick another thing, get that done. <laughs> wow. That's a golden nugget. Uh, I have a daughter who I think uh, when we tell her to do, uh, you just help, you just really helped me. My youngest, uh, when we're trying to tell her to do certain things, I think she might have some of that same issue. So I'm going to try that today. Okay, yeah. If you say that. wash the, go, go wash the clothes, do the laundry. You have to say, put separate, you know, separate the pants, separate, you know, each thing has to be step by step and to show them progress, check it off the box. I would keep a sheet, a list, okay. check it off the box. Okay. no. That's <laughs> and now great. my daughter does her own list. Okay. All right. 27 that's, now. <laughs> that's very, very helpful. You, uh, I mm -hmm. think my wife is probably writing that down downstairs because she's watching. <laughs> yeah. That's very helpful. Um, at Becoming Disciplined, we examine discipline or organization, like I said before, in the following areas, spirituality, mental, physical, emotional, finance, calendar or time organization, home organization or data organization. Can you tell us which of these do you consider your strongest point and which of these are, are your weakest point? Let's see. I'm going to look at your list because I do have your list. Um, I would think spirituality is my strongest point because it's the one thing in my life that's never wavered. Sure. My spirituality has never wavered. It's always been there for me, no matter what I've gone through. Um, home organization, I would think. And, and I will say this. Everything else on the list is a balancing act. Mm -hmm. You know, spirituality has always been constant for me. But everything else on the list is, is a balancing act. But my time, I am very, very protective of my time. Mm -hmm. There are things that I have to do on the weekend so that my Monday goes well. And it's so bad. Some people call it a control freak. But if it's not done, I can't. Monday doesn't start right. And if mm. my day doesn't go right, first thing in the morning, I have to start over. I have been so bad as to get back in the bed, start over again. Because right. it has to be in order. You know, wow. Everything has a place and an order. Oh, wow. That's very good. That's good. To you know, know, I recently moved and um, I had people saying, you know, let me come over and help you. Let but I needed to know where every box was. And as I unpack a box, I need to know where I put it. So mm. if you walk in my house and you ask me, where's the book with the so and so, I can tell you exactly where it is. Oh, wow, 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 wow. That's, you truly are. I'm, I'm very glad I invited you on the show. Wow, that, that more, more of us need to hear that. More of us need to hear that. Now, what's one of your weak points, though? Be disciplined. Subscribe now. Definitely relationships. Okay, okay. Definitely relationships. Um, I I haven't quite figured this out. I am I have not been very successful at personal relationships. Um, I've been married twice, currently separated, um, and not separated because of um, lost love. Um, but I, I I struggle with relationships, and I don't know whether it's in the choices that I make, or the fact that I'm very independent, or um, it, I don't know. I, I, I struggle in relationships and I would like to improve on that. In fact, earlier this year, I decided that I would go into counseling so I could understand how do I keep ending up in this position. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. That's very transparent. And we thank you for uh, yeah. Yeah. sharing that. And, and, and I just as a golden nugget for our listeners, um, the willingness to seek counsel, mm -hmm. uh, especially I know it has to be tough, you know, when, when someone's already accomplished and they already, I want my listeners to hear this. You have someone here who has various degrees, who has, who's very accomplished and they're still willing to get counseling. Absolutely. And, um, and I just want our listeners to know that when it comes to, um, I really believe in Christian counseling. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, what I'm, I'm going to, it's going to be the first time I'm, I'm not getting paid at all, but there's an organization called safe Harbor that, yeah. Yes, yes, Safe Harbor. And their website is safeharbor1.com. Mm -hmm. They're a list of Christian psychologists who yep. give counseling and training. So I don't believe in turning your mind over to everyone, but right. you know, I, I do believe you have to be careful. Right. But I want our listeners to know that um, Sister Joy has done something there where she's willing to, you know, to get help or to, mm -hmm. to, to, to get some type of guidance and some type of help because sometimes – once we become grown and we leave the house, you know, we stop listening and we stop yep. getting, uh, yep. we stop getting help, you know. And pray about who you choose to counsel with, you know, yes. be very prayerful about it and discerning. 
Yes. Um, and discerning, even if you start with one person and that person doesn't seem to be, you know, a spiritual, spiritually guided, don't mind going somewhere else, but definitely be in prayer about who you choose to go into counseling with. Let me share this with our audience as well, is that my mother passed in 2016 from diabetes and dementia and um, the dementia being caused by the diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and I got counseling as well. And, yep. you know, I got Christian counselor, Christian, a Christian psychologist and counselor. Mm -hmm. But I will tell my audience the same thing that you just shared. I'm just piggybacking on what you shared. Mm -hmm. I walked out of several counselors. Absolutely. Offices. And I wasn't rude or anything. Mm -hmm. I just walked in and realized, no, nah, this isn't for me. Not for you. Yeah, yeah not for me. And then until mm -hmm. I found the right person. So right. finding the right counselor is very similar to finding a good church. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, mm -hmm. you've got to be willing to, to yep. go to one, more than one. And mm -hmm. The first church you walk in may not be your church. Yep. You know? Right, so, right. So you've got to be willing to get dressed on the next Sunday and go. Yep. Try it again. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, so you answered the other question. How do you plan to develop that weak area? You, you are getting counseling, getting help, uh, which yeah. we all need. Now, mm -hmm. some people believe on focusing on strengths and ignoring weaknesses. Uh, what do you believe about that? Huh. So it's probably a fault that I overcompensate. Um, because I do struggle in areas of relationships. And, you know, I mentioned um, marital relationships, but I think I struggle outside of that as well because of I, I tend to be an introvert, you know, and there are a lot of people who have been really kind to me. And because of my ability to shut things off, I may not have reciprocated. So, you know, that's a struggle. But um, so I overcompensate by being more accomplished than I really need to. You know, so I'm, I'm constantly working on something when I should put it down and focus on relationships. Sure. You know, I, I will hide behind work sure. or the next degree or, you know, the next thing rather than to deal with the relationship issues. Yeah, I can understand that, you know, and, and I'll be I'll, I'll just be transparent with our audience. Um. I'm nowhere, I'm nowhere near as disciplined as you. That's why I call this podcast Becoming Disciplined because I'm, I'm trying to mm -hmm. get where you're at. Uh, uh, not from a degree standpoint, but from a just a daily process standpoint. Right. But I will share this is I've invested a lot in relationships and with people. And uh, it, it does take a certain level of faith because you invest all this in people and people. When you have a degree, you have that degree until you die. Mm -hmm. But this relationship that you've invested in people, it can be very malleable. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you invest in certain people and then they can they can break your heart sometimes. Mm -hmm. So so I, I understand that because when you accomplish certain things, there's no way to take there's, there's no way that anyone can take away from you that accomplish. It's, it's difficult when people come to you and, and I don't know whether I would call it advice, but, you know, consultation. And then when you say, well, what about this? No, that's not going to work. Well, what about this? And that's not going to work. And after a few of those, I was like, okay, well, I'm out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. If you're not willing to do the work, I'm not sure what you want me to do. <laughs> right, 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 right. Because uh, I've had this happen as, as well, is I've given pastoral counseling <clears throat> and I kept saying the same thing over and mm -hmm. over again. And I would say it different ways. Yep. And I would... And then eventually the person didn't listen, but they kept talking to me. But when they failed for not listening to my advice, then they kind of blame me even, you know, and I'm like, OK, yeah. well, like, how do you get off of that? You know, yeah. how do you, how do you <laughs> No, this is it. Right. Well, now this is also for our listeners. Um, one thing I learned and I learned this actually where I lost some people that was a. Um, there was a suicide, you know, there was mm. a, a, there was actual murder suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, if I did not have notes for the counseling session I gave, I don't think I would even be here today. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is when some, when you lose people and you were a pastoral counselor to someone, yeah. a, a couple where it, it ends in a murder suicide, you begin to ask yourself, what in the world did you do? You know, yeah. what did you do wrong? And the thing that helps me is I look to my last message that I sent those, you know, and I sent mm -hmm. I sent them to Safe Harbor. Mm -hmm. I sent, you know, I sent uh, mm -hmm. I sent them to a, a counselor. Yeah. Knowing I, I that had, you couldn't you know, do anything else. You're right, right, right. But if I didn't have those notes, mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because you know as well as I do, when you counsel people, you say a lot of things. Yep, yep. But if I did not have those notes, I don't think I would be able to mm-hmm. sleep at night. You know, yep. so, so um, you know, that's why I stress, you know, if you're helping someone and you're in the business of helping people, you need to keep copious notes mm-hmm. because when so things go, uh, go left, you need yeah. to be able to have some type of record where you can go back and say, OK, yeah. you know, yeah. um, I, I, I did the right thing or yeah. this is where I can do better. Yeah. And But, uh, you know, that's the nature of the shepherd. You know, not only do you help and guide and lead, but you feel sad when one is lost. Like, what did I do? You sure. know, how did I where did I go wrong? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And, uh, and, I, and I won't lie to you. I won't lie. Uh, we talk about emotional discipline. I was depressed for a long time. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Even though I had the notes, it still it doesn't help you get over the depression. Absolutely. Uh, now, what book or passage do you recommend within the Bible for people who are seeking discipline? Perfect one for me is First Thessalonians chapter four, mm. verses eleven and twelve. Okay. And it says, "To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you <laughs> should mind your own business Amen. and work with your hands." Amen. Just as we told you, so that your daily life may be may win the respect of outsiders and you won't be dependent on anybody. Amen. Paul's Amen. words to the church at Thessalonia. I, that, that's it for me. Amen. Work with your Amen. hands and mind your own business. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to put that in the show notes. That's that's <laughs> good. That is awesome. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, what book outside of the Bible do you recommend that has helped you upon your path? had several books that have helped me. Um, I had a very tumultuous career um, being a woman, a black woman, you know, coming from the South. I had a lot of things going against me in the environment that I worked in, primarily with, you know, white males. Um, and I spent 16 years on Navy ships as a civilian. Oh. So I had a lot of challenges there. Wow. Um, yeah. So I had a lot of challenges and I had one book, I thought I had it with me. Um, it was lessons from women written by an army uh, officer woman about how to navigate being in, you know, around men. There, and there was like 10 things. But the one that stood out for me was um, never let them see you cry. Mm. And be, it's something about being strong when you're weak. Mm. You know, and so that book, even though it had a lot of nuggets in it, the one that really helped me was never let them see you cry. And I would walk. I don't care if I was on a ship, I'd go out on a flight deck, wherever I was. If I was out in the desert, um, there's a good portion of my book that gives an account of me walking in the Somali desert. But most of the time, it's to get away from those things that I would normally cry about. Um, And I found that theme throughout my entire career and it's carried on into my personal life is when I feel stressed, a meeting, a conversation, whether it's a relationship, go for a walk. I can think clearly about how I should respond, but this whole concept of never let them see you cry has really helped me, you know, maintain balance really. Now I do cry, but it's a safe space that I choose to cry. In, you know? Sure. sure, sure. Yeah. My, my pastor taught me the same thing. Mm-hmm. People say, Oh, well, it's okay to cry. Yes. It's okay to cry, but you have to, especially in the military, um, they will they will seize upon that. There are people yep. in the military. Not every the military environment is like leadership. The whole environment is who's going to be the lead, who's going to be the leader, who's going to be the leader. Mm-hmm. And weakness, there's a place for it, but you got to learn where that place is. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> now, um, can you now? This is a little off topic, but you mm-hmm. had a, an adventuresome life. Uh, what was the most harrowing experience you went through on all those boats? Hmm. I believe there uh, there are several. There were many because oh. most of my time was spent in the Middle East and Africa. So there were many, but I probably the the scariest was being chased uh, somewhere um, in in it was, it was in the Middle East. It was probably in the Persian Gulf somewhere. Um, being chased by boats. There was a young man on the boat. We were on a, a rib. Mm. He was Jewish, mm. um, and we were in an Arab country, and he had on a I don't know what they call the things that they were on here, but we were, yeah, we were being chased. Mm. He was driving. He would not stop. Oh, wow. So they had guns pointed at us. They were chasing. 
you know, we were eventually arrested and we were arrested a lot, but this was the scariest because we were in a foreign country. They didn't know why we were there. All we had was a piece of paper that was written in Arabic uh, and we called it our get out of jail free card. So it wasn't unusual for us to get stopped and get taken somewhere to a police station and we have to stay there till the embassy said we were good. But being chased by boats with guns pointed at us in the middle of nowhere was probably the scariest. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Goodness gracious. <laughs> being dropped out of helicopters was not as scary as being chased <laughs> by guns. Wow, wow, wow. Now when those times you were arrested, were any of them ever did they ever get real physical with you or? You know, I can honestly say whether it was the Middle East of Africa because or Africa, because that's where I spent most of my time. I never had, the men did, but I never did. Oh, wow. I never did. Oh, wow, wow, wow. The, now, they, I was always treated with respect. Oh, that's powerful. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Especially when you hear, you know, as people travel and everything, mm -hmm. you hear the worst horror stories. So yep. that, that's, that's good to know. Now, uh, regarding the subject of discipline, or anything that you would like to share with our, our viewers? Do you have any closing thoughts? Closing thoughts on discipline, yes. My closing thought on discipline is that when you're setting goals for things that you want to accomplish, try not to put timelines on them. Okay. Because when we feel like things aren't happening fast enough, we give up and we could be so close to mm. finishing. Um, remember I told you I didn't get my high school degree? Sure. Um, and I didn't finish college in four years. Sure. I co-opted, I quit, I got put out, I dropped out. It took me seven years sure. to get my first degree, sure. but I got it. Nobody cares how long it took you to get it. Amen. You know, and I never stopped going to school after that. I was always in school, but it was probably another 10 years before I got my first master's degree. Sure. You know, so if we take the element of time out of our goals, mm -hmm. we'll get there. The time is going to pass, whether you get it today or tomorrow. Sure. But if we take the element of time out of it and just do it, sure, we'll get more accomplished. That's good to know. That is good to know. <laughs> now, I'm asking this out of sequence. I have another question for you that's mm -hmm. slightly off the topic of discipline, but it's just so much about what, who you are. Uh, I, I was looking over all of the things online and all of the things that you do, and you seem to have a love affair with the seat. And for those of us who are not as scientifically uh, educated or mm -hmm. uh, we may not have grown up in Moss Point, mm -hmm. uh, what is your what is your can you share with us, you know, your st a story of the sea or your philosophy of the sea that may may many of us may not fully grasp or understand? Well, you know, life and the sea. I mean, th there's always a metaphor for life that you can find in the sea. One of them I gave earlier about being able to negotiate boundaries. I think there's a place uh, where the, the salt water and the fresh water meet and you have to learn to negotiate boundaries. So I will never be fresh water. Fresh water will never be salt water, but we can meet, negotiate our boundaries and still live harmon harmoniously together. Uh, another um, um, analogy that I like to use is um, because I was an oceanographer and I did nautical charts and I had to know where uh, deep water was and shallow water was, you know, if the numbers, you know, if, if, the, if things get more turbulent, mm -hmm. that means you're closer to land. Mm -hmm. You're closer to where you want to be for peace. Mm -hmm. You're further out at sea. Wow. Water is deeper. Things are calmer. But once things get really rough, that means you're close to land, you know. Oh, wow. So I like to use <laughs> use those analogies. You know, it's the things that are closer to shore are more turbulent. They're more different. They're more dynamic. You know, everything's different, but oh. you're close to land. You're close to calmness. <laughs> that's, that's so good. That's so profound. Mm -hmm. That is so profound. Now, I got one more bonus question because you answered all my questions in such a concise and such a disciplined way that mm -hmm. we actually finished a little earlier. Okay. But uh, so, so I have another bonus question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and this, and this is good for our listeners like myself who sometimes don't go in the ocean that often because my daughters always want to go in the ocean and I go in there just to make my daughters happy. Yep. <laughs> I'm always scared. Something's going to grab my daughters in the yep. ocean. So can you tell us, uh, you know, you've spent more time in the ocean than most of us. Uh, did you ever have an experience where something got jumped out and bit you or something grabbed you or, or uh, what are your thoughts on, on those of us who deal with that phobia? You know, it's funny when I look back over the things that I did, 
with no fear. Mm -hmm. um, there were probably many things that jumped out and grabbed me, and, and I should have been afraid that I wasn't. You know? <laughs> but um, I had no fear at that. At, I have more fear now than sure. I did then. You know, just thinking about my mother knew that I was out in the middle of nowhere. We did not have GPS when I first started doing this. Mm -hmm. And we did not have cell phones when I first started doing this. The only thing we had was a, um, a radio and a radio officer. Um, right. But no, I think because I put in time, I did a lot of things in the shallow water, the deep water. I don't remember anything that fe that I feared so much that I could remember it, you know? Okay, okay, yeah. all right. I got one more bonus question. I got one more bonus question. When you, f when you first started uh, studying oceanography, it was before, mm -hmm. I I'm assuming it was, or well, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming it, it may have been before the, the technological revolution that we've gone under in the 1990s. Right. Uh, getting in the 90s. I started in the 80s, yeah. Yeah. So how is this all of this technology, you know, because you you were studying more at first, I'm assuming, with just the hard, you know, yep. math and you know the hardcore yep. science of it. And then mm -hmm. now you have all of this technology that's been layered into it. Yep. How has that been integrating all of that into, you know, your your career when you first started? So now I don't know if you know this, but now, um, even though I'm not on Navy ships, I'm an engineering manager and we uh, develop sonar systems. So I work with the group that develops the sonar systems that go on, on the ships. But for younger people, it's more difficult for them to grasp because they're not getting the basics and the foundation. You know, I like to do building blocks. We do this because of this. People usually say they don't understand math and science. And so they just want to get to the hands on which buttons do I need to push? But if you understood how things work from the very beginning, the foundational principles, then when something breaks, you don't have to ask me. You don't have to look for the book because you know how to figure it out. Mm. You know, I, I remember DOS. So when something happens with my computer, I don't need to necessarily call an 800 number because I know I can do a few things and, you know, get, get back to p young people are not getting that part. And especially in the high level, um, high end technology, you know, they, they understand computers. But when you start talking about sonar systems and other things that we use at sea, they don't understand the basics. So you have to, right now we're developing technical manuals and it, it's one of these, push this button, push that button. You have to give them step by step because they don't understand the basics. Mm, that's that's good to know. Yeah. And we're living in a world of specialization where I think we're going to have more and more of that where people don't understand a lot of the basics. And uh, sadly, an undisciplined thing that people are doing is that um, they don't understand the complexity of the other person's job and then they jump in and sometimes can make a, a absolutely you know absolutely really knowing what what's what what the other person's yeah. job is i want to know all the details if i ask a question it there's no such thing as too much information i want to know all the information because i don't want to have to keep coming back to you, <laughs> you <know? Sure. laughs> Well, well, Ms. Joy, I just want to thank you. I just I want to thank you for coming on, especially I really want to thank you because I know now how disciplined you are with your time. So you, I, you giving me an hour. I really appreciate you giving me mm -hmm. this hour, uh, even though it didn't really fully make it into an hour. We didn't make it an hour because you're so disciplined. So I just I really want to thank you for your time. And, and uh, I just want to thank you. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Enjoy. I want to thank you for being who you are. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. You are a very calming presence in our community and uh i would never know that you were an introvert you know just because of the way yeah. you carry yourself and the yeah. and and how you give of yourself to others yeah. so I, I i i am honored to know you and uh and even as we were doing this interview i was like wow joy's even more disciplined than i even knew and i knew she was disciplined before we started the interview now she's even more disciplined than i ever <laughs> could have imagined so so uh we really appreciate you and we we yeah. thank you coming on. I appreciate being a co-laborer with you as we do what we have to do in the vineyard. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. God bless you. <laughs> Hello, this is Joy's book, Forward from the Sea. We strongly encourage you to purchase that and support her. In addition, we also want to share that our lives at Becoming Disciplined, our lives were changed by this interview. We received everything from tips for visual learners. We received a great parenting tip that we are already implementing. And we are reminded that none of us are too accomplished to get help and to seek counseling. This interview was confirmation for the need 
of becoming disciplined to be on the airwaves. There are quiet people in your community who are disciplined and they are the fabric of what holds your community together and they need a platform and they need to be listened to and they need to be learned from. So we also thank Joy for reminding us of why we created this platform from the beginning. Thank you for listening to Becoming Disciplined.